Hello, Internet, and welcome back to Makers on Tap, the podcast where makerspace directors drink and talk about making stuff and maker culture. I'm your host, Aaron, and joining me tonight are... It's just me. There's no R. It's is Joe. Yeah, that's right. We have a lot of really great articles lined up to talk about tonight. First off, what are you drinking, Joe? I'm drinking uh, Wake Up Neo from Triptic Brewing. It's a double India pale ale brewed the hazy way featuring citra mosaic and some other word hops. It's very aromatic. Like it definitely when you crack the beer, it's like, oh, I can really smell that. But it, it, I don't know. Flavor wise, it's kind of all over the place. I'm just drinking vodka and Sprite. Would that be Kirkland vodka? It most certainly is. <laughs> I am all out of beer. We're going to get that Costco sponsorship one of these years. <laughs> oh, yeah. Do you realize what episode this is? It's 49. Yeah. We have almost been doing this for a solid year. Oh, man. Three weeks, man. Three weeks away, we will have done this for a solid year. That's a thing. I don't know how I feel about it. <laughs> hasn't felt that long. Mm-mm. No, I feel like we just started this. Except for like all the weekends where we're like, crap, I don't know what else to talk about. <laughs> Those make right. it feel like a year. <laughs> like this weekend. And with that. Yeah. So let's get on to our news topics. There's like, we actually have a lot of really good news topics. And that's not do. just because that's not just because we don't have a topic lined up. <laughs> <laughs> we have a topic lined up. It's just, you know, a thing. Uh, Tom's Hardware put out an article earlier this week about their attempts at overclocking the Raspberry Pi 4. And with the latest firmware update, it brings a little bit better uh, thermals for the chips itself. And they were able to push their test Pi up to 2 gigahertz, which is up a whole 500 megahertz from the uh, stock frequency of the chip. It's just silly. Like, I remember a time when my friend got a 1.6 gigahertz laptop and he was like, this thing is so fast. It wasn't that long ago. I, I, I have a one gen newer version of that laptop sitting on a shelf next to me. Yeah, I remember uh, configuring one of the first desktops that I helped buy for my family. And it was a Dell, like the first Dell XPS uh, desktop. So it was like the big honking silver full size desktop. Oh, those were fun. It had a it had a one gigahertz Pentium four in it nice. with hyper threading, and I was like, "That thing's gonna be screaming." I'm gonna play so much Command and Conquer. Yeah, you were. Yeah, love that game. Yeah, so I actually um, spent some time with my Raspberry Pi four, and I was able. They say that um, with the ARM chip on the Pi fours, you get the same sort of silicon lottery like you would with any desktop CPU, yeah. where it really depends on the binning of the the silicon itself, whether or not you can get a full two gigahertz out of it. Um, you definitely need active cooling to make it work. Um, I just have a very, very large heat sink on it with no fan, and it's still overheated during a stress test. So you definitely need a heat sink and a fan. But it seemed really stable for me when I was doing it. Um, I ran it for about five minutes, and there was no crashes. It just overheated. I was able to overall also overclock the GPU as well by 100 megahertz, so... Nice. From 500 to 600 megahertz on the GPU. But sadly, it doesn't really help me with my silent recording desktop setup. Discord still hates me. Discord's a hog. Yeah, the Pi still hates Discord and any sort of video on the screen. Yeah, when we were trying it earlier, everything worked good until we turned the video on, and then it turned into a stuttery beast. Yeah, so I just don't know if it's going to work, but that's fine. Let me say this. It doesn't work for my use case, which was for a silent recording PC. Besides that, like, it feels like a normal desktop, like, especially with the overclock. It was snappy, and it just felt like a normal PC. And that's insane for, what, the $55 for the 4 gig model? Yeah. Maybe you should put that high on the mini mill and put BCNC on it and everything. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because BCNC is running at the limits of the current pie on it, right? Definitely. Yeah, that's a great idea. Definitely. It pushes it hard. Unfortunately, you'll lose that beautiful hobby fab graphic, but <laughs> I think I could do without it. It's so cool. Though. <laughs> All right. Next up, Open Builds on their Twitter profile. They shared somewhat of an, an older forum post from 2018, 
but it was new to me and I think it's neat. It is a C-beam based rack and pinion setup. Um, if you're familiar with the open build C-beam lead screw motion actuator setup, you have extrusion going in a bit of a C-shaped profile and with a lead screw going through the center. Yes. And that kind of saves you some space. And then, you know, if you have your little captured nut in there, it'll, it'll, uh, it will pull, you know, your carriage back and forth. But that also requires belts or a lead screw. Um, this was specifically aimed at the belted version. And in the title, it says Death to Belts. <laughs> And it looks real neat. They managed to put a, a rack inside of the C-beam portion. And the pinion is mounted directly on the shaft of a stepper motor. And it looks very clean. It does. What do you think about this, Joe? Um, I like all, everything about it except for direct driving the pinion from the stepper motor. Uh, because you usually end up with such a high pitch between the gear and the rack that you can't really get into a stepper motor's effective RPM range before you're just going so fast that it's not usable. So usually when you see rack and pinions done really effectively, they're geared down about three times. It's like a one to three or a one to four gear ratio. So I, I think if he would have done the gear ratio thing, this actually could be super viable. But right now... Um, unless you're driving like a plasma cutter or a pen, something that can drive extremely fast with very low loads, um, this wouldn't work super well. I think you could probably adapt this to give it some gear reduction. Definitely. Just offset the motor a bit. Yeah, you offset the motor. And um, if you look at like um, CNC router parts, uh, rack and pinion setup, they have a really nice gearing setup on it that would be fairly easy to reproduce using some 3d printed bushings and a couple cheap bearings like you could do something pretty good with this setup and you know just like a cantilevered motor to get the gear tent or the belt tensioning right for like a belt drive uh to drive it it wouldn't be that hard this is a good start yeah i think i'd also maybe move it to a dual v-wheel for each yeah. of the profiles, because I think that's one of the big problems that some of the Sphinx routers have, yeah. where it's only one side of V wheels, so you get a bit of a what do you call it, like a lever type action, like yeah. force on the wheels. Yeah, and when I even on my laser cutter, I've had wheels explode, um, just being loaded and being used for over a long period of time, and I kind of wonder if a double v, a double wheel would lessen the tension and make them last better because that was even with polycarbonate wheels so that i wasn't even running dullard wheels when i had just wheels just come apart on me so what are the extreme wheels made out of those are polycarbonate okay the one unexpected consequence of running polycarbonate wheels in a laser is laser smoke makes them gummy which i didn't expect interesting yeah but i i like how he integrated the rack into this like that's yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think that's part of the whole appeal of it is that the rack is hidden inside the C beam. Yeah, so you get the strength and rigidity of the C beam, and then you can also utilize some of that empty space by throwing the rack in there and having the pinion in there with it. I will say though, if I was going to do something like this, I would mount the rack on the other side so that the teeth are upside down. So if this is on a CNC router or anything that's going to make a large amount of chips, those teeth are just going to pack full of dust and chips. Even if it's inside the C-beam? Definitely. Okay. Yeah, if you look at the backside of my gantry that is built like a C-beam, there's like an inch of sawdust in it. Oh, okay. So. In other news, Patheo had a very big update. Yeah, they did. Do you want to talk about that? I'd love to. So I've been using the crap out of Patheo for like the last two weeks. And I think Gabe is really sick of me because <laughs> I went really quiet for two months on the forum. And then I just was like, oh, I'm going to use Patheo to do this tool changer project because I'm sick of Simplify. And then it was just like, and this doesn't work and this doesn't work. And I don't like how this code came out. And I don't like how this code came out. And <laughs> You're going to need to change this. And uh, he really went. I, th I think I drove him nuts for a few days. But um, we've come up with solutions for almost all of it. And uh, 
this latest update I am really, really excited about. So they put out a blog post called the Big Beta, and the biggest part of it is Pathio now has manual support enabled, and Yay. the way that it applies the manual support is with a paintbrush of selectable size. So any of you that have done manual supports in, we'll say Simplify, and spent 30 minutes clicking to add all of your manual supports or clicking to remove all of your manual supports, that's all done with a brush stroke now. And you can change the size of the brush by just holding control and scrolling your mouse wheel. It's so intuitive and it feels so good and it works really well. Um, the supports work really well. I, I couldn't be happier with it. And uh, actually, Aaron, you haven't seen this yet. Never remember how to put these headphones back in. Um, in the latest round of betas, multi-material works really, really well. Ooh. Yeah. Nice. So, uh, I've been playing with the multi-material version of the Snow Labs Penguin, trying to get a working multi-material one done for the uh, contest that Snow Labs is running on the Railcore community right now. Granted, I'm not running it on Railcore, but they said it didn't <laughs> matter. The things I like about it are uh, it's very easy to select uh, what nozzles are going to run what material and what parts of the print. Um, it's very intuitive to to tell it what models the nozzles are going to run. Um, and if I wanted to run a support nozzle, that's really intuitive now. And like with Simplify, if I was going to run uh, multi-nozzles and um, I wanted to change what nozzles, I have to build a new process for every nozzle uh, to set up the temperatures and everything. And that's all done in checkboxes in Pathio now. It's so straightforward. Um, Pathio is now my go-to click and print for my tool changer. Uh, there's just a, like two little things that they, they have to fix. And the biggest one, if anyone's trying to mess with it, is right now um, immediately following a tool change, it will unretract the amount that it retracted before the tool change. So if I'm switching from a Bowden tool to a direct drive tool, which is what I'm doing for this model that I showed you, which is the Snow Labs Penguin, um, when I put my Bowden tool away, I'm retracting four millimeters. And when I pick my um, direct drive tool, it's been primed and ready to go with my primed script from my tool unlock. And then all of a sudden it comes back out and it unretracts four millimeters. So it just dumps this nice. huge glob of filament. <laughs> um, but we figured out a way around that using the uh, scripting engine and Pathio. Uh, Gabe put together a really nice uh, script that basically looks to see if it had recently done a tool change and then it negates the unretract. It, so that's working out for me. And um, you know, now that that's been brought to their attention, the team's looking at it now. So... Um, yeah, it, it and it's working remarkably good. Like this was the first multi-material print I did and um it's got print in place, little movie parts and stuff and it it turned out okay. One of the wings broke when I tried to unlock it and it's stringy because my bowdens aren't tuned in well, but that's not Pathio's fault that I haven't spent the time on my printer. <laughs> Are you using the uh slice directly to duet feature yet? I am. How does that work? So it it's you slice it and you get your G code preview. And now they have a really nice G code console that you can look to make sure your code all came out right. Where normally you would have the saved G code button. Now you have saved a G code and send to duet. And it sends it directly to my duet. And then um, once you send it, that button turns into open duet and it opens up the web interface. Oh, yeah. Nice. And then you can just run it. Or um, you know, I hit send to duet, and I can walk over to my LCD, see it pop up in the SD card menu, and, and just run it. Um, but like, overall, it I have gotten my profiles down to the point where I can just send it and go. 
which I never got to with Simplify. So I'm really happy. My tool changer is starting to feel like a tool instead of a project. And we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Yeah. I'm really excited for the, the slice, the send the duet function, because I'm going to be using that in my new printer that we'll be talking about later. It's super handy. Yeah. The biggest news thing for tonight, uh, Adrian Boyer, the father of RepRap, he is, is really funny because he actually teased it like a day before. He was he's saying, you know, keep an eye on here for the next couple of days. Some big's coming. Then just the next day, he just tweets it. And it's a new blog post on his proposal on electric 3D printing. I had Joe read through it. And I read through it too. The article is not that technical. So it's, a, you know, don't be afraid to go through and read it. It'll be in the show notes. He essentially takes three relatively new concepts in 3D printing. One of them being the reverse CT scanning concept that Berkeley University did, where they took some images of a CT scan. And instead of like taking the image in, they, they shot the image out of a DLP projector, rotated a vat of resin inside of another vat of fluid, which takes out the refraction of the light. And just by rotating that resin and showing the images, they can cure the resin almost like one profile at a time. So within one rotation, you have a 3D object. Yeah. Taking that concept, combining it with a newer way to take CT scans using electricity, electric current. So this is based off the Spectra, which had a, a crowdfunder. It was a, it's a lower cost CT scanner. And the idea is if you submerge the subject in conductive fluid, put some electric probes in the fluid, if you read back the electrical current, it will change based on the location of the probes, I believe. And you can actually create a map of that, and you can create somewhat of a, a 2D profile. Yeah. Almost like a cross-section of what that object looked like. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the uh, Spectre crowd supply page, which is just super cool that they did a crowd supply for this. Yeah, they're, they're using conductivity mapping across the two probes. Yeah. So with the conductivity mapping, it is taking in the reading based on the electrical values and then creating an image. What Adrian is proposing is doing the reverse of that. Instead of reading in electrical currents, sending out the electrical currents. If you can precisely replicate that, you can create kind of like a point of electricity or energy in a specific spot. Yeah. And there was there was some math and shit involved with that. That's that's about <laughs> where he lost me. Um, but the third important thing was a monomer to polymerize to a solid by passing electricity through it rather than light. That is straight from the article because I couldn't synthesize it any other way. Yep. <laughs> and he has a bit of a visual here, which is uh, imagine a, a cylinder kind of vat with your resin or whatever in it. But the vat is surrounded by 50 columns of 100 or so yellow dots. Each yeah. yellow dot is what I'm guessing is a conductor or a probe. Yeah. So sending electricity between two probes that are, you know, directly opposite of each other, that would give you that electrical reading if you were to do a scan. But if you were to send electricity through it, you could then polymerize a monomer at a specific spot. And that's kind of the whole basis. If you put all three of those together, you get his proposal. Which sounds really slick. Yeah, it's really, really neat. And it, if he can pull it off, he mentions in the article, but like, I, I kind of came to this conclusion as I was reading it. Like, you could make a solid object in a few seconds. You have a whole bath of polymer, and then you're sending in all of your currents essentially at once. So you're, you're solidifying yeah. all of this in one shot. Yeah. Like, you're kind of hitting that, that point of sci-fi. Like, I know I've seen this in sci-fi movies and I can't think of one off the top of my head, but like where they're like, all right, now I'll electrify the bath. And then the bath goes like glows blue and green for a second. And then they just like, whoop, there's, you know, there's the Terminator. <laughs> right. Um, yep. But that's kind of where this is going. And that's super cool. Like this makes sense to me because uh, have you ever seen those, um, they're like uh, crystal things in the middle of a mall 
and they have like a 3D etching that happens inside the middle of like a acrylic yeah. crystal. So the way they do that is there's multiple lasers that shoot in that are low power. And when they hit, they make the right wavelength and power to etch that specific point. So like they all shoot in to a focal point inside the crystal from different angles. And when they combine, they can etch, but not before. So that's kind of how that happens. I think that's what he's going for here is like, you know, these have to, these probes have to make contact with each other. And when they make contact in a specific point, they will polymerize the resin. Yeah. The word integral was used a lot. Yeah. So it's like the integral of where the two electrical currents meet is where it would polymerize. At least that's the theory. Yeah. And this is where I would lose the job if I was being interviewed because I would just be like, <laughs> yep. And then pick up my beer and drink it like now. Even he said in the article, he's like, I might be using all these words wrong. I'm not a chemist. <laughs> yeah. I kind of want to send it to my chemist friends now and be like, explain this to me. Yeah. I mean, you know, I actually tweeted back at him. I asked him, you know, what, what do you think would be the biggest challenge to make a proof of concept? And he said was getting the, the monomer solution and then also the math to figure out that integral where it would polymerize between the two probes. I feel like that would be the hardest part. Yeah, because then once you figure that out, I mean, at least for proof of concept, he, he said that you could get the solution, put just two probes in, two singular probes in the solution, and then just rotate them manually yeah. and try and make a cylinder. If you can make a cylinder kind of polymerize, then you know that the it pretty much works, and then it just becomes more of how do you automate it and add more probes. And I wonder if the number of probes or number of conductors, like the number of dots in this image, Equate to resolution. Yes, definitely would. More dots, more dots. Yeah. Wow memes. It's just like, um, you know, in current SLA, where your pixel size equates to your resolution and your X and Y. Yeah. So, you know, these are our, our essentially voxels or, or like voxel yeah. engines. Yeah, 3D pixels. So. I just want to know how you end up individually addressing all of these conductors, all these probes. That's where somebody like you comes in. I know, that's going to be a challenge in itself. Can't you do some, some like, I2C magic or something like that? It, it'd have to be, man. I mean, even even I2C squared C has a limit, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, so a single chip can theoretically quadruple the number of i squared seed slaves, 127 times 8. Another chip can be configured up to 8 addresses on a single bus, so 8 times 8 times 127. I feel like it's probably going to be I squared C, but I feel like you could quickly uh, maybe reach the limit of that. Yeah. It would probably work for a benchtop machine. And th that's a relatively low enough bar to dive into software wise that it'd probably work for a cr proof of concept. But I imagine we'll quickly be inventing methods to work out these problems. I wonder what NeoPixels use. Because I mean, NeoPixels, I don't, I'm not aware of a limit. With how many you can use? Pretty sure NeoPixels are I squared C. Huh. Anyway. Yeah. Interesting challenge. Yes. I saw that and I figured this was pretty big news that we should at least cover it. And I didn't want to wait another week. Can't afford that. Stale news. <laughs> I'm reading through the article and I'm like, Aaron, I am not in the headspace to understand <laughs> this tonight. And he's like, suck it up, Joe. So I did for you. Thank you, Joe. Listener. Thank you for caring, Joe. I, I care about somebody in all this. Speaking of listeners, we had a question this week sent to our Gmail. Andy emailed us saying, love the podcast. Thanks. He's learning a lot from it. He said that he often writes his own G code for 3D printers to produce very well controlled but simple structures for testing purposes. He was wondering if there's any software that we use to write G code or do you write it in either manually or with handwritten scripts or Excel. I personally do not, but Joe, you have a lot more experience with this than me. I avoid writing G code by hand at all costs, but you know, occasionally it, it's helpful. The only time I write G code by hand for printers is when I'm trying to do macros or something for like something like the tool changer or redoing the wipe sequence on the lulzbots or um, 
something where I'm trying to manually control an air move um, or trying to do like a purge sequence. I've never sat down and tried to figure out the uh, extrusion to movement relationship so that I could manually write my own printing code. Um, I know of some people that have, and we've talked to them on the show. Uh, Brian, Sarah, uh, who we talked to at uh, Milwaukee Maker Fair last year, uh, he does his own G-code scripting through Grasshopper. He writes all the code for his uh, ceramic printers uh, manually like that. But now when I'm doing the scripting, I, I usually just use Atom or Sublime Text or some other raw text editor. That does bring up a good point, though. If anybody out there is ever manually writing code, whether it be for a CNC machine or a 3D printer or a laser cutter or anything like that, um, always use a text editor, something that is built for code. Never use a word processor like Microsoft Word or LibreWord or a Docs or anything like that because they put in special characters that are invisible uh, for their type formatting. And CNC machines will read those and just go like, what is that that you would like me to do, human? Because I don't understand that character. Um, and I've seen some crashes, actually, because people have written code in, like, Word, and it outputted in a weird format. Like, the lines didn't stay consistent. So, like, um, let's say you're doing a G1 move. So, a G1 move is a standard feed move. So, you can move an X, Y, and Z in G1 and with a specific feed rate. With that feed rate, it will stay and a lot of controllers will stay modal, which means it will stay that feed rate until you put out another feed rate call to change it. And in some controllers, the G1 will be modal. So like if you make one G1 move and then the next one, it's just an X, Y call, it will still be in feed. If you put out an X coordinate and a Y coordinate on the same move, that will make a diagonal move or on the same line, that'll make a diagonal move. If you put out an X coordinate on one line and a Y coordinate on the other line, that will make a straight line in X and a straight line in Y. And depending on what you're trying to do, those are both good or both bad. <laughs> and uh, I've seen um, word processors do weird things where they like don't, end up having all of the lines on or all of the code on the same line. And you know, you have unexpected moves that you thought were going to be coordinated and all of a sudden they're not. And now you're moving through machine components. Use a text editor always. You know what I think? What? I think that if you, if you have to handwrite your own G code, there's a lot of things in software development that could help you minimize issues with that. Uh, Joe, you touched on one of them, which is use, you said use an editor. I'd recommend using an actual, something like, you know, Visual Studio Code or Atom, which is what VS Code is based off of. But also check out VS Codium, which is the free and libre open source binary of VS Code without all of the Microsoft telemetry in it. Anyways, VS Code has a uh, G Code syntax highlighter. Does it really? Oh yes. So oh. then it will it will highlight all of your your G commands, S commands, M commands, X Ys, all different colors, so you can clearly see what your code is doing. But also, I would actually start looking into languages like Python or Ruby, and maybe start building up your own framework of G code writing functions. So say if you're doing the same sort of steps every now and then, like draw a line, draw a circle, do whatever, uh, maybe doing a tool change. I don't, I don't know what you're doing. If you're doing it more than once and you're typing it out more than once, maybe write a function that spits out to a text file, you know, write this line and then, you know, given parameters, you know, do it that. Start, maybe, maybe start building out your own framework. And Python's really easy to start out with and Ruby's really easy to start out with. And I'm starting to be more of a fan of Ruby just because one of Ruby's priorities is optimizing for developer happiness, which is <laughs> an entirely new metric for me. And I love it. But just doing, maybe just doing something like that. You can use whatever language you want, but 
if you're doing a lot of G-code hand coding, I think you should maybe start looking into automating some of it. Some of it. Um, yeah, because you could, because then, because then you can, you know, if you know what you want to do and you wrote it yourself, you could almost make your own framework, your own scripting language, and say, okay, you need to do this and this and this. So now instead of hand coding it for the umpteenth time that you've hand coded in the past, and maybe you've hand coded it in the past, and you have to copy paste it into a new file. Anytime you do manual stuff like that, you introduce risk for errors. Yes. And anytime a human has to intervene, then you run the risk of errors. So if you can automate that, almost make your own scripting, your own framework for writing G-code, that might be a good way to go forwards if you're doing this a lot. Yes. And actually, for 3D printing especially, I really like that a lot of the slicers will import your G-code and give you a representation of what your G-code is creating. Like, that is really, really nice to uh, to do error checking. Because with C, C machines, you can run them through the simulation and the cam all day. But if your post-processor isn't written correctly, what the simulation is showing you is not what the code will do that is produced. Um, because it happens before the post-processing happens. So they make NC machine simulators, um, and depending on the complexity of your machine, they can work really well or they can be completely worthless. Uh, but um, it's, it's always good to check your code and understand what the code that you're doing does. Uh, being able to read through your code, even if it's just your header, that's like doing your preheating and all of, all of that stuff. Being able to check all of that when you're setting up a new slicing software or a new cam software um, is really, really useful. And is definitely a skill that's worth acquiring. Saved me so many times. Or, or at least made the troubleshooting easier when I crashed something. All right. Good question. Yes, thanks for sending that in. And if anyone else has any questions, we'd love to answer them on the show. And I would like to know more about the things you're making with your code. If you can send us pictures, I, I want to see them. Joe, do you have anything you're working on currently? So much, so much. So uh, this last week, I dove back into um, a lot of projects, but specifically, I have dove back into the tool changer and Pathio. And... Um, just like 3D printing as a whole. Uh, every year after Mirth, I, I have this like two month lull where I just don't touch my printers because I beat myself up so much before Mirth trying to get things done. And I, I'm making my way back out of that now and actually getting some stuff done now. Um, but recently I have added physical end stops to my tool changer. Because sensorless homing is a joke if you need your partner to be repeatable. <laughs> and you guys can challenge me on that all you want. But I'm seeing uh, half to almost full millimeter changes in my positioning with sensorless homing. Wow. And Yeah. It's not okay when you need your positions to be right. And a half millimeter will cause dropped tools on the tool changer. Um, a full millimeter is like guaranteed dropped tools. So yeah, if I end up in a situation where I do drop a tool, uh, the machine has a, a switch on it that will tell me that tells the machine that a tool is not present when it should be. So it'll go over to a park position. And it'll cool all the heads down to standby temp. Well, then I have to home out X and Y and if that X and Y home isn't repeatable, my print now has a shift in it. So my my penguin has like three shifts in it. Oh, my wing broke all the way off. Uh, but the penguin's got like three pretty good shifts in it from having to home out mid print. So I added physical end stops to it. And uh, I really like the duet for things like that because changing from sensorless homing to physical end stops was changing one integer in my homing configuration. I had changed it from S3 to S0 or S1. Like, that's all I had to do to tell it that it had home switches now. Nice. That's pretty rad. <laughs> 
So what was it using before for sensorless? Uh, just the stepper drivers on the Duet itself. The trinamic the, stuff? Yeah, the trinamic drivers. Yeah, okay. And, you know, if you have a single tool head, it's fine. You know, like, uh, the way the Prusas are using it, things like that, it's fine. But when you need your tool head to be incredibly repeatable, it's not good enough. Um, and that that's what multiple people in the tool changer beta are finding is having issues. Um, I'm not the first one to add physical in stops to my machine. I just finished a huge print. That was like 40 hours and two kilograms of filament. That was fun. Oh, the SL one has found its way back into my heart. The, um, did you see the, the print or the, uh, the post on Reddit? last week where the guy got the massive chemical burns from yes. the SLA filament. Yeah. Um, so, or uh, filament, resin. SLA resin isn't a joke, guys. Um, if you have a strong stomach and you haven't seen that, you should go check out the 3D printing subreddit. Uh, so essentially what happened was he was moving his SLA printer, didn't empty the vat, some splashed down the front of him and got on his shorts. He cleaned up the printer and like wiped his shorts off, but didn't wipe them off good enough. What he should have done was taken his shorts off and gone and taken a shower and like fully cleaned himself up. I uh, finished out his work day and um, I think two days later ended up with some really serious chemical burns that resulted in skin graft. Yeah, it was like a whole day later. Yeah, is when it happened that day. No big deal. He had a little redness, he said. The next morning, it was a little bit more red, but then by, like, the next evening, it was, like, swollen. And yeah. then by, he had to go to the ER, and then giant blisters all the way down his thigh. Yeah. Just giant blisters, fluid-filled <sighs> blisters. So, SLA resin is a sensitizer, so it will continually make you more sensitive as you come in contact with it. So if you let it sit on your skin, it just constantly gets more and more sensitive and like activates that area more and more. Uh, so just don't touch it, breathe it, look at it, <laughs> you know, take it seriously. So we crowdfunded a, the Wan Hao D7 SLA printer at the space like a year and a half ago now. Yeah. And none of us really knew how big of a issue the resin was. Because none of us knew. Like, this was kind of a learning thing. Mm -hmm. You know, none of us really wore gloves. Oh, God. And, <laughs> and uh, just getting anywhere near the printer, you can just start to taste it in yeah. your mouth. Just You can just taste the resin. <laughs> so someone slapped a thing on the, on the printer saying, edible. <laughs> edible resin. And now, and now after all this, it's like, it's a bit cringy now. Yeah, it's not a funny I didn't joke. realize how serious it could be, you know? Well, yeah, like... Um... If I'm in the garage with the SL1 running and I they, I was drinking a zombie dust, which is one of my favorite beers, and all of a sudden it was like zombie dust tasted like plastic. Yeah. And I was like, why does my beer taste like rotten plastic? It's and, so weird. And it, it started to dawn on me that like, that's just kind of like kind of tastes like resin. And I I went out of the garage for about an hour and I tasted that beer again um, and it didn't taste like it anymore. So it had totally built up in the back of my throat from breathing the fumes. And the SL1 has a filter on it. Like it could be significantly worse. Um, so anyway, the SL1's found its way back into my heart by printing these super high resolution parts to make my Titan extruders on my tool changer that much more accurate. So I'm reprinting the filament guides that are inside the Titan extruders. Uh, I found this model on Thingiverse and it's a filament guide that goes up inside the hob and bearing to constrain the filament that much more. And it allows you to take the Bowden tube all the way up and kind of trim it out. And way it. up there, way Marty. up there. So, you know, you end up with uh, almost no unsupported area around your filament, that much more accuracy. And 
I reprinted all of my uh, Bowden backlash clips, the little locking clips that go in the push to connect fittings. I printed them in multiple thicknesses up to two millimeters uh, to eliminate my Bowden tube backlash to try to uh, rein in my stringing that I'm seeing. And it was just really fun to be able to run these prints super quick. Like the Bowden clips took 15 minutes to print 20 of them. Uh, nice. Yeah, it was like a super good use case to have the SLA here. Um, I'm probably going to print all of my fan ducts in SLA just because they're nicer than uh, I know I offered to print your fan ducts in SLA as well. So um, once I get those designed, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm finding my uses for it. So I actually started working on uh, getting the printer bot simple pro kit put together. I'm glad you're working on yours. Yeah. It's going to motivate me to do mine. Well, I'm only, I was only motivated because I saw you post about getting yours done. I'm Excellent. Like, well, fuck, I got get I got mine done. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> if Joe's working on his. <laughs> Anyways, uh, I've been spending most of the week working on. So this is a very bare bones kit. Like all we got was the the sheet metal, and we got the linear guides, linear rails. That's basically it. And the rest is up for us to kind of find and put together. Neither of us got the heated bed. Um, those sold out before we got them. Yeah. So I was looking into options for that as well. I'm, I'm actually planning on going full 24 volt for mine. So I, I have a 24 volt power supply that I got um, from another company that went out of business. I also have a couple of E3D Super Whopper stepper motors that I kind of want to put on the X and Y axis for that. 400 millimeter per second printing. Yes. <laughs> yes, I'm Probably really excited. Not, honestly. Bigger steppers doesn't necessarily mean more speed. We can really throw it around. Yes. I plan, uh, I've got some uh, E3D credit that I'm going to use to get an arrow and a volcano hot end. My current challenge is, even if I were to get a heated bed for this, the the original PrinterBot Simple Pro heated bed was 12 volt. And it turns out there's no good way to run a 12 volt heated bed when everything else is 24 volt. The consensus seems to be, if you want it to be actually safe, is to actually have a separate 12 volt power supply and kind of toggle it with a MOSFET board. If I can if I can figure out how to get that made, I think the rest I can figure out. Because I'm actually going to try and squeeze a Duet Wi-Fi in there so I can get some wireless printing because I really want to use the Pathio, you know, slice directly to Duet. Because um, I want to make this a really, like, super beefy, overkill, portable printer that I can take to events or I can just, like, keep it upstairs and just, like, print things. And it, this is going to be my new, my essentially my new printer just for stuff. Yeah, I think that's it for my projects that I've been diving into lately that I can talk about. Yeah, I mean, besides the printer bot build, I did get my PCBs in for the, the access control system. Found a couple slight issues with my design. I was able to come up with, you know, manual fixes for most. The biggest one, which I haven't figured out yet, is when I put my ESP32 on the development board, I can't flash it anymore. I can't get it into the bootload mode, which flashes. Oh. I have to take it physically off the board, flash it, and put it on. But even then, I haven't figured out if it actually works, if it's on the board. So I just haven't spent the time with it yet. Weird. Yeah. So I talked with um, Fred, who's a retired electrical engineer at our makerspace. And he recommended just using the uh, female to male jumper wires and just start doing one at a time from the ESP32 onto the dev board and seeing when it stops working. Yeah. Because he looked at my board and he couldn't really see anything that jumped out at him and I showed him my schematic and he couldn't really see anything. So it's just one of those things where it's going to take a lot of time just sitting there trying the same thing over and over again. I just haven't dedicated that time yet. You think it's going to take a lot of time. It's probably going to take like one beer's worth of time. <laughs> and you know you might get lucky and it's like the second wire <laughs> yeah you gotta do them all to make sure it's not it's just that wire yeah I'm kind of dedicating all my effort into the printer bot now though I don't know I just, I just kind of needed a break from the from that project I understand it kind of consumed me for a month or two which is why I take a break from printing after Murph you know, though, I, I'd say the biggest thing I've been working on lately, though, is getting everything ready for MakerFest. Yeah. So MakerFest 
is two weeks away. And um, we went to the meeting today. Before this meeting, I was really panicky because we had lots of big, giant gaps in our layout. And then I went to this meeting and they're like, you're full. We can't have any more people. After I made a post making a last call for a lot of people and a bunch of people messaged me and like, oh, I want to come to Maker Fest. I'm like, you couldn't have told me that two weeks ago, huh? <laughs> um, so now we're like shoving people around in corners and like trying to make people fit, which is a really exciting thing. Uh, this year we have TH3D coming from Indiana. We've got Project R3D coming from Rockford. I think that's where they're at. Uh, we've got Cohesion 3D coming from New Jersey. Uh, we've got Joel uh, Leonard, the uh, Thorminator dude. Where's Joel from? I thought he was from Tennessee, and Jay thinks he's from Oregon. I don't know where Joel actually is coming from. Joel lives in all of us. So. <laughs> Leave it there. That's the best answer. Joel lives in all of us. He's bringing his giant hammer. Hey. This is we also we also have a giant hammer. We do. Uh, we have a member at the makerspace who made it an equally sized giant hammer out of wood, and he's about as tall as Joel. Like Joel's like six foot something, like very tall. <laughs> and Don is also about his size. So I mean, just two very tall dudes with very large hammers. It's gonna be great. And they both drive little tiny cars. Yes, they do. <laughs> 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 I think I think Don's like six eight. He's either six seven or six eight. Yeah, Joel's about that size. He's a big dude. I was hanging out with him at Namcon. He's a tall dude. I want to build a big 3D printed hammer. I think I've got time. Scratch that. Yeah, I know I have time. Um if only if only the Mazev worked before we took it down. God damn it. That would have been perfect for it. You know, I almost have 19 days and I don't have to design <laughs> it. <laughs> Designing's most of the work, Joe. Yeah. Building, it's easy peasy. God. The challenge has already been solved. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mazov 2. I, I'm so excited for Mazov 2. I got it. You know, I need to talk to Kyle about Mazov 2. Yeah, because it's all bound to be built again. And, but it's special belts. Special. Special belts. Yeah. Maker Fest. If you guys can make it, Maker Fest is August 10th. In Peoria, Illinois, you should come. Uh, Makers on Tap will have a booth. I will have a booth. Um, I decided today that my booth is going to be advanced 3D printing techniques. So I'll have the SL1 there highlighting how I've been using it to make things better for my other printers. I'll have my tool changer there and I'll have at least one printer there doing large format extrusion. Um, probably won't be a big printer, but it will be a printer with a ludicrously sized hot end and nozzle. Don't worry, Joe. I'll just run the podcast and the makerspace tables. My stuff's going to be in the makerspace. I run Makerfest, <laughs> you <laughs> loser. <laughs> Aaron's over here pretending like he helped. <laughs> oh, I did not help whatsoever. <laughs> All I did was sign up to run the podcast booth, but I'm also the president of the RCL, so I have to like help with that as well yeah i remember when you took over president and my wife was like oh so you're not going to do maker fest next year and i was like well about that ha uh <laughs> probably gonna do maker fest next year but you guys should come it's super fun it's free you know there won't be beer at the thing but we're also have a lot of friends coming in from out of town this year so there might be beer after the thing so if you want to come Makers on tap with us after Maker Fest. That might be a thing that could happen. Where can people find the Maker Fest thing or Ignite? Ignitepeoria.com is the website. Maker Fest is part of a much larger event called Ignite. I, uh, Ignite is a creation fair. So we have performance art, temporary and fine artists, um, makers. Uh, this year, we have a whole thing dedicated to people with sensory issues. So um, people that are like autistic or uh, just have issues with that. We have a whole area dedicated to them. Um, and uh, 
you know, making the event even more accessible to everybody. Uh, our event is 100% free, so it's free to attend, it's free to exhibit. Um, we do have a number of corporate sponsors, so sponsors for MakerFest this year have been um, TH3D, Project R3D, um, to think who else sponsored MakerFest specifically. I can actually find that out for the next episode, but those are the ones that came <laughs> off the top of my head. Um, lots of our Murph friends have given us money to help us make our event happen, and I'm super excited about them. So, thanks, guys. Awesome. And uh, we'll have the funnest Makers on Tap episode yet that weekend, because that will be one week short of our one year. Oh, man, yeah. That'll be a really good weekend to get a lot of really good interviews. Yeah. I'm excited for MakerFest this year. I've been really stressed out about it sucking. And after today, I'm just like super thrilled about it not sucking. <laughs> but this is this is the Maker Fair roller or MakerFest roller coaster that I'm on every year. So it's fine. Anyone who organizes a Maker event gets it. Way to alienate most of us, Joe. <laughs> and with that. <laughs> <Shit>. Keep making stuff. <laughs> this is the end of the podcast. Cast. 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 Cast.